welcome to the Mad in America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James. Welcome to episode three of the Mad in America podcast. Thanks so much for all of your feedback so far. And if you'd like to get in touch, you can email us on podcasts at madinamerica.com. It would be great to hear from you. This week, we have a special episode to join in with the events being held for World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. To give some context around the issues with benzodiazepines, we have three interviews in this episode. Firstly, we talk to Professor Malcolm Lader, who is Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry from King's College London, and is globally recognised as an expert in benzodiazepines. Following that, we talk with Jocelyn Peterson. Jocelyn is a US-based campaigner who shares her own experiences with benzos and talks also about her views of the medical response to the issues of dependence and iatrogenic harm. Finally, we talk to Barry Haslam. Barry is a veteran UK campaigner who shares his experiences and also talks about what we should be doing to help those dependent or damaged from use of these medications. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that you can visit the website wbad.org, that's w-bad.org, for more information on the awareness raising activities. First this week, we talk with Professor Malcolm Lader. Professor Lader is Emeritus Professor of Clinical Psychopharmacology at King's College London and was an external member of the scientific staff of the Medical Research Council for 35 years. He was an honorary consultant at the Maudsley Hospital and conducted clinics dealing with patients suffering from anxiety, sleep and depressive disorders and drug treatment problems. His experience in psychiatry and clinical pharmacology now extends to over 50 years. He has published over 100 research papers on the subject of benzodiazepines. In 1978, he called the drugs the opium of the masses because of the very high prescribing rates. In 1981, he warned that in the context of tranquilizer addiction, there is an epidemic in the making. And in 1988, he stated that this was the biggest medically induced problem of the late 20th century. Professor Lader was an advisor to the World Health Organization on the drugs used in psychiatry and is an honorary fellow of the American College of Psychiatry. His main research interest is still the drugs used in psychiatry and in particular their side effects. Professor Lader, thank you so much for talking with me today. Firstly, for the listeners, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be interested in psychiatric drugs and particularly benzodiazepines? Yes, um, thank you. I trained in medicine and then specialized in clinical pharmacology. That's the use of medicines in practice uh, and then in psychiatry and then went into research when I researched the benzodiazepines, the tranquilizers. Um, I then became more and more interested in the dependence problems of benzodiazepines um, and have been campaigning ever since. Thank you, Professor Leder. And I just wondered if you could help me understand how benzodiazepines were initially created and the conditions that they were most commonly prescribed for. Well, uh, the old phrase, time immemorial, people have wanted substances to help them relax, take the edge off their tension. And that's alcohol has been very popular, so has cannabis uh, and coming back now. Uh, and then um, there were other medications in the 19th century, like um, uh, peraldehyde. And then the story, I suppose, really starts at the beginning of the 20th century with the introduction of barbiturates, uh, drugs like um, secobarbital and so on. But these turned out to have many problems. They were dangerous and overdose. They uh, were uh, likely to cause dependence. And the search went on for safer drugs. Amongst those, um, the drugs by the mid 19, well, the end, end of the 1950s, uh, the benzodiazepines had been discovered and described. And the first one of those, which was Librium chlordiazepoxide, was introduced. It was soon followed by diazepam, Valium, and then by a whole series of other compounds. And for a time, Valium was the most widely prescribed drug um, on Earth. It was used very widely, and um, it has never really been uh, replaced. There are still doctors who prescribe the benzodiazepines, less so in the United Kingdom and becoming less in the United States. 
but there are many places where the benzodiazepines are freely available. The uh, advantages are that they are relatively safe in overdose, uh, and it's unlikely that um, you become uh, addicted to them, although you can become dependent on therapeutic doses, and that is, I think, a difference between the barbiturates and the benzodiazepines. The barbiturates are very likely to become addicted. The benzodiazepines, you have something like a one in three chance of becoming physically dependent. There is um, addiction to the benzodiazepines, but it is not as common as you might expect in view of the wide usage. Thank you, Professor Leder. And just talking a little more about the dependence potential of benzodiazepines, I believe that in 1999 you famously remarked on a BBC Radio 4 interview that it's more difficult to withdraw people from benzodiazepines than it is from heroin. I wondered what it was that led you to that conclusion, and also if you felt that those difficulties are better recognized now than at the height of benzodiazepine prescribing. We first got concerned about the benzodiazepines, a view of the wide usage, but by about 1975, 19, the end of the 1970s, my unit at the Maudsley Hospital were becoming more and more alarmed by the problems that our patients were having uh, withdrawing from the benzodiazepines. Now, I was um, working in an addiction research unit, and we were often asked to see patients who had abused both uh, opioids, drugs like heroin, uh, or amphetamines, or benzodiazepines, often in combination. And from the clinical experience that we gained there, we noted uh, that patients who were having problems with both the opioids, with heroin, say, and with a benzodiazepine like um, Ativan, uh, could come off the heroin with um, an acute, rather unpleasant withdrawal, but had much more dif difficulty uh, withdrawing from the benzodiazepines, which was much more protracted, mm. and although not as severe, gave them at least as much problem. And we were left with patients who had successfully withdrawn from the uh, heroin, but were still having problems with the uh, benzodiazepine. And these were patients who were actually... Uh, abusing both heroin and the benzodiazepine. But even those who only occasionally used um, heroin were showing difficulties in trying to stop the benzodiazepines and um, they often uh, had quite severe reactions. I think it's quite shocking for people to realise that some classes of psychiatric drugs can be more problematic to stop than illicit drugs. That's quite a realisation for some people, isn't it? Well, that's right. And of course, we've now got the problem, especially in the United States, of people who have been started on opioids, like mild heroin-type compounds, uh, and um, they escalate the dose and there's overdoses with it. And the, the whole story has been repeated again uh, with, uh, I think, intrinsically more dangerous drugs because um, the opioids, um, like pethidine and so on, are dangerous in overdose. The benzodiazepines are much safer in that respect. So we just don't seem to learn. That's sadly true, isn't it? And there does seem to be more recognition in mainstream medicine now that benzodiazepines can result in dependence very quickly and that they should be only prescribed for short periods, most notably from the British Medical Association. I wondered what you felt about the medical authorities becoming involved in these issues. Yeah, well, the BMA, uh, where Johnny's come lately, I mean, they were not interested for 30 years. It's only recently that they realize that uh, they need to get involved and give advice to their members who are GPs. And I think the reason is that um, there is an increase in the concern generally, and lawyers are now um, getting opinions that the long-term use of benzodiazepine is intrinsically um, negligent. So the GPs are being... 
um, sued for long-term use. And there are uh, expert GPs who will agree that this is negligent. I think the BMA are just looking after their members, as they should, of course. But, I mean, the idea that somehow uh, they have uh, you know, been involved for any length of time is, um, I think, a misconception. The regulatory authorities have been involved, but they don't have the uh, uh, clout to uh, get doctors to prescribe in a more responsible way. Let me explain what I mean. It's not that GPs, who are the main prescribers, deliberately put people on long-term use. It's just that they, they just slide into it. They don't monitor their patients. They don't realize that they've got a population of patients who are long-term users, and the reason they're long-term users is they can't withdraw. I understand. Thank you, Professor Leder. And I wanted to ask what you thought was the best way for us to influence doctors and GPs to encourage them to have more open and honest discussions with their patients at the start of treatment. To explain that whole classes of psychiatric drugs, while they have benefits, there are also drawbacks, including dependence and withdrawal difficulties. How should we influence doctors to be more open in their discussions? Um, I think my reading of what is happening is that general practitioners are finding themselves subject to censure both uh, general and legal and the uh, there are cases coming through uh, in which general practitioners have been found uh, guilty of clinical negligence with long-term benzodiazepine use and they I know mean, several settlements out of court but of course, the, there's no uh, admission of um, negligence uh, involved in that. So I think that the BMA have decided that they really must protect their uh, members and are taking these initiatives, which I welcome. But, you know, I'm not sure about the motives. It's such a shame, isn't it? Because the people who do end up dependent have a high likelihood then to suffer additional health difficulties further down the line. And those difficulties are likely to need further time and resource to resolve, aren't they? So by not helping people in the early stages, we probably create further problems downstream. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean most people don't run into problems with benzodiazepines. But you have to take into account the third or so who do have problems and of those perhaps another third perhaps 10 percent really have difficulties mm. and uh, we need to protect them the treatment of the withdrawal is not straightforward it's not simple so it's a much better strategy as it usually is in medicine to prevent the condition uh, arising in the first place so it really goes back to education of gps mm. Um, now, they run into problems with the benzos, they're running into problems with the antidepressants, and in some countries, particularly in the United States, uh, there's a difficulty with uh, opioid analgesics, and although some of that is illicit, uh, some of it is at least, at least initiated by uh, medical practitioners. So I think that the first thing is for really much increased uh, education. And I think the BMA do have a part to play here with education. Treating the condition is much more difficult and there are various initiatives and helplines and so on. Uh, but it's really just support of no specific treatments. Um, although there are one or two things in the pipeline that might be helpful, but uh, there's very little uh, financing for a treatment of benzodiazepine dependence. Nobody um, is going to make any money out of it, essentially, yeah. and there's going to be competition for scarce and NHS resources. Thank you, Professor Lado. What seems to be happening is that lessons that should have been learned from the last 50 years of overprescribing of benzodiazepines are now failing to be learned in relation to other classes of psychiatric drugs too, notably antidepressants and antipsychotics. Prescriptions for antidepressants alone are increasing at an alarming rate. In 2016 in the UK, we prescribed 64 million antidepressants alone in a single year, and no doubt there are similar increases in other countries too. What do you believe is driving this extraordinary increase in psychiatric prescribing? Well, I think, first of all, 
one must make a distinction between the benzos and the antidepressants. The benzos have a very limited efficacy. They're often used as sleeping tablets, and that is really a, uh, can become a problem quite quickly with people dependent on them night after night. The antidepressants do have a, uh, a vital function to play. There are people who are quite depressed and may even pose a suicidal risk, and it's important that um, we treat these people uh, with the appropriate treatment. Now, the reason for the increase in prescribing, I think, is uh, there's a recognition of depression. Uh, it used to be usually overlooked and uh, all ignored. Now, I think there's greater recognition, but GPs uh, will resort to medication, as they do in others. I mean, there's the antibiotic problem. But the GPs, certainly the older ones, haven't had the sort of general training um, to help uh, with the non-pharmacological treatment of uh, depression. So, uh, you know, I think that it's um, uh, a question again of wider training. Now, the other thing is there are two other groups of professionals who could be mobilized. Firstly, uh, we can have the pharmacists acting as a a whistleblower. They can look at the prescription and say, hey, do you realize this is your, you know, you've been on the benzodiazepines for six months now and this is beyond the time that you should be. And they can then alert the GPs. And I think pharmacists should be given that encouragement. I think they have the, uh, already have the right to do that, but I think they need the encouragement. The other group are the clinical psychologists, but they're not, um, not enough of them and uh, they can help, but they tend to do it in a rather stereotyped, rigid fashion. But there are two other groups of professionals who should be involved. Thank you. That's very important, isn't it? Because we know that general practitioners have limited time and are under a great deal of pressure. And pharmacists probably do get to see people who may have been prescribed a number of psychiatric drugs together, and they have the expert information almost off the shelf, don't they? That's right. I mean, they are well, I mean, they are experts, professionals, and they're looking for a role. They don't just be counting out pills all day. They want to have a much more involved role, a much more well, part therapeutic role, but certainly an educational role. Thank you, Professor Lader. I wanted to ask a little bit about the work of the Lader Ashton organization. I just wondered what your involvement was. Well, I was just contacted by some people in America who said they wanted to set up an educational site like this, and I, I just gave it after looking into what they proposed to do. I've given it my endorsement, but um, I'm not heavily involved. I just do endorsements and keep an eye on it. I was not involved in... Uh, I, I mean, I was involved in vetting the educational material, but this is essentially... Uh, the initiative of other people. I think that it's great work by others, but we should also recognise that having your name and Professor Heather Ashton's name involved in this gives a seal of approval. When looking on the internet to self-support, it's very difficult to know what is valid, scientifically sound information that people can use to educate themselves, but your name being associated with this organisation has made a real difference for people in need of advice and support. Thank you. And Professor Leder, as today is World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day, I just wondered if you had a message to give to those who may be listening. Well, I, um, I mean, I welcome this Awareness Day. I think this is the second one, isn't it? It is, you're right. And the fact that it's being repeated, I think, is a very positive sign because too often these uh, initiatives peak uh, with interest and everybody sort of rather lets it all simmer down again and can be forgotten. So I'm very pleased that this is seems to be becoming an annual event. I think it's important that people are um, aware of this, but I think it's also important that there should be um, emphasised that this is just part of a much larger awareness of mental health issues, uh, which have been relatively neg neglected, certainly for all of my professional lifetime. It's always been the Cinderella subject. And uh, this is, I think, one area where the awareness can be raised very effectively. Thank you. And I just wondered if you had any words for someone who may be taking a benzodiazepine and may be concerned about it. 
Well, I think there is, although there are websites, they have to be careful which they go, which they look at. But it is useful if they arm themselves with some information and then go along and see whoever's prescribing these medications and discuss with them the need and the, the risks and benefits of the continuing prescription. Thank you. And Professor Leder, are there other issues that we need to be aware of? Uh, I am, you know, concerned uh, about the lack of um, research funding for this area. I mean, as I said, there are possible further treatments, but they're not being looked at in any systematic way. And it would be useful if there was some ring fencing of money, not for me, I mean, I've retired from research, but uh, ring fencing of money for some younger people to take on the initiative. I think that's very important because I had heard that because the current classes of psychiatric drugs, particularly antidepressants, have made money over the years for pharmaceuticals, that they're really not putting a lot of research effort into alternatives. And I just wondered what your view of that was. Well, I think you say they made a lot of money, but that's, that's well in the past. They're not very, not very lucrative at the moment. The problem with developing drugs used in psychiatry is the prediction from biochemistry to animal experiments and then on to human treatment uh, is poor. So you do much better with other forms of um, other areas of therapeutics. And I think that's one of the points. Pharmaceutical industry uh, is losing interest in psychotropic drugs. Uh, and uh, we're not going to get, I think, any major advances um, uh, for a long time. That's interesting, isn't it? And from where I am, the focus on alternatives to psychotropic drugs is a good thing, but not everybody might agree. Well, I think, I mean, the psychotropics we have are largely symptomatic. They don't really get to the root of the problem, and therefore um, their usefulness is limited, and you have to, therefore, look at the safety and make sure that that is adequate for the limited efficacy. Professor Leder, thank you so much for your time today. I'm very grateful to you for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. I'm very grateful to Professor Leder for giving us that overview of benzodiazepines. Now we move on to talk to those that have lived experience of some of the issues that Professor Leder described. Next we talk to Jocelyn Peterson. Jocelyn is a long-standing campaigner, writer and performer who describes her own experiences taking benzodiazepines. She founded the Benzo Information Coalition and has a YouTube channel dedicated to raising awareness of benzodiazepine adverse effects, dependence and withdrawal. She has been involved with several benzodiazepine support groups and has written many articles on the issues around these drugs. Jocelyn, thank you so much for talking with me today. Firstly, for the listeners, can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you first came into contact with benzodiazepines? Sure. So I was actually really into alternative health and, and nutrition. I never took medications. Um, but I went through a period of time after uh, my third child. Uh, she was in the hospital with meningitis and I was nursing her. So I wasn't getting much sleep. And then I brought her home and then um, ironically, my son went into the hospital right after that. So I really wasn't getting any sleep and, and things were difficult. The economy was bad and my husband didn't really have work at the time. There were just so many stresses. And, um, so I was looking into taking something natural to help me sleep. But when you go into the health food stores here, everything says, don't take while nursing, don't take while nursing. And that kind of frightened me. So I thought, well, I guess I'll go into my doctor and just take something that they know is safe. <laughs> yeah. So I went and I said, is there something you can take that doesn't affect the baby? And he, he told me that Ambien was safe to take. So my first experience with tranquilizers was actually Ambien. Um, this wasn't the second time uh, my OBGYN had actually prescribed me the same medication when I was pregnant with my son for a period of time. And the first time I took it, I got off it and I had no problems. It was, you know, a little difficult to sleep at first, but I was fine. So I figured, okay, I'll just take it for a short period of time, get well, and then get off. Uh, so I took it for about less than a week, and I was really concerned because I noticed it really was affecting the baby. So I decided this wasn't safe, so I just got off of it after about five or six days. And um, that's just when everything spiraled out of control. Um, I couldn't read I couldn't watch TV I couldn't I mean I was in so much pain I couldn't even walk around the block 
Uh, I was losing weight rapidly. Um, I never slept and it was, it was horrible. And I went into every specialist that you could. And I had an MRI of my brain and a CAT scan of my pelvis. And I had a tilt table test <laughs> because my blood pressure was insanely low. And I had an EKG for my heart because I had all these weird symptoms and everything came back negative, of course. You know. And so the doctors kept telling me, oh, you have postpartum depression, you have postpartum depression. And I kept really fighting them saying, no, I, I, I lost my first son and I know what depression is. This is not depression. There is something wrong with me. But when they couldn't find anything, I thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe I'm broken. Maybe something inside of me just broke and they're right. So I was prescribed Ativan at one milligram and um, Effexor. And they told me to only take the Ativan until the Effexor kicked in. Uh, well, of course, the effects are never did really kick in. <laughs> and because I was going through uh, a benzodiazepine withdrawal syndrome. So, um, but the one milligram of Ativan did slightly help. And after one month, I went back into the doctor and he said, how are you doing? And I said, well, not great, but a little better. So he said, well, let's just double your dose of Ativan then. And as soon as we did that, I felt better. So I thought, wow, they must be right. I needed these drugs. But, um, of course, I was instructed to get off these because Ativan was only for short-term use. And I kept trying to cut it by a quarter of a milligram. And I would just, again, my m symptoms would just spiral out of control every time I would try to do that. And so I would get back on because I couldn't function like that. So three years later, I decided it was finally time to just get off of the, and well, I was in a lot of pain still, so they actually switched me to Cymbalta. So I was on Cymbalta, and um, I decided it was just time to get off because the Cymbalta wasn't helping, and I was suddenly putting on a ton of weight. My blood pressure skyrocketed, and I was in pain all the time anyway, and I would go up to my room and fall down on my bed and just fall asleep in the middle of the day. So I got off the Cymbalta, and it was kind of rough, but I actually did pretty well after getting off and doing some cognitive behavioral therapy to sort of help rewire my brain from what that medication did to me. And then my husband and I wanted to have another baby. Um, and a lot of women don't know, uh, you know, women of childbearing age don't realize that when you're on a benzodiazepine, that they're a teratogen. And the most dangerous time for you to be on that is within the first eight weeks of your pregnancy. So most women don't even know that they're pregnant <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when they're taking it by the time, you know, that they realized that this is a danger and that they need to get off. And that was kind of my situation. We, we got pregnant and my doctor said, you need to get off of this right now. So I started cutting by a quarter of a milligram and I descended into hell. And then the next week I cut by another quarter of a milligram and I descended into hell further. And then I thought, okay, well, let's try an eighth of a milligram. And, and I just, it got to the point where all I could do literally was writhe in mental and physical agony on the ground. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't think. Um, it was just pure suffering day and night. And of course, you don't sleep. So there's no end to your suffering. Jocelyn, I just wondered what your doctors were thinking about this, because benzo withdrawal is still not as well recognized as it should be. So what was the reaction of your medics? Well, to be honest, I, I didn't consult with my doctor during that time. He told me to get off and I worked on getting off. We figured it was going to be kind of rough because we, you know, I knew what it was like when I tried to get off before. So we, we thought, OK, we'll just sort of muscle through this. It's summertime. We'll just get maybe we, we'll get some help with the kids until um, I get off this and get better. But of course, what I didn't realize is that I wasn't going to be getting better anytime soon. So the next time I saw a doctor was actually in the ER. I was um, going through a miscarriage. My husband had gotten online and he found benzo.org.uk. He looked at the support groups and he said, Jocelyn, this is you. All these people are saying that you have to taper this really slowly, that you should cross over to Valium. Um, you, all these symptoms, all these things, um, all these other people have the exact same symptoms. So in the ER, I, I just begged the ER doctor to please switch me over to Valium, which he did, surprisingly. And I, I stabilized out a bit. Um, you know, we lost the, the pregnancy. And um, I spent about the next year and a half 
uh, tapering off of Valium. Jocelyn, what you describe is so shocking. It's stressful enough to go through a miscarriage, but to have all those withdrawal effects to tolerate too, that must have been so difficult for you. And I wanted to ask, when your husband found the support groups and you came to realise what was happening to you was caused because you were trying to withdraw too quickly, how did you feel about that realisation? Well, I think I felt a sense of relief because I... I didn't know if I was crazy, if I was a drug addict. I mean, I, I did actually look into some withdrawal centers here for people who are addicted to drugs. And basically they told me, um, you're already getting off. There's really nothing we can do for you. If you're already getting yourself off. What are we going to do for you? Um, so I, I was, I guess I was happy to know that this wasn't really an addiction problem that I wasn't crazy and Jocelyn you described transferring onto Valium how did you approach your withdrawal from the Valium and how long did it take well I spent about a month stabilizing out on the Valium or or trying to stabilize out and in the meantime I think I that's when I finally decided to join an online support group I was a little trepidatious about doing that I'm not exactly sure why other than you have a lot of sort of irrational fears when you're going through benzodiazepine withdrawal but I I joined the support groups learned how to develop a proper Ashton style taper along with um, a micro tapering method that's been developed within these um, support forums and I just took it one day at a time I you just have to sort of go at it and do it at a pace that's bearable for you and when it's just too unbearable you hold so you're still in hell but it's not like it's like you've ascended from Dante's 10th circle of hell more to like the fifth or so (laughs) (laughs) so you're still in hell from day to day but now I've realized of course after doing more research and helping people online and um, just with all the experiences of all the people that I've encountered it it didn't have to be that difficult If I had started off doing things right, I I don't think it would have shocked my body as much. I've I've helped a lot of people who um, are about to begin getting off their benzodiazepines. And the people who start off doing it properly have far fewer complications. And it's still difficult, but it's not nearly as as hellish for them. I think you're right. And what many people don't realize is that just because you can function one day doesn't mean that the next day will be the same. It's a highly variable experience, isn't it? And there's no predicting that one reduction is going to give the same result as the previous one. And that's very difficult to contend with, isn't it? It is. It's really hard when family sees you and you're able to, I mean, I I was able to attend my sister's wedding right after my crossover to Valium. There were even a couple times uh, where I performed because I'm a singer And I was able to do performances. And so I, you know, I know that people think, oh, well, she can do stuff when she wants to, or, you know, there's just that sense of, oh, well, she's just depressed. I I know some people, uh, like a year or two after I had started my taper, they said, oh, we thought that you were just depressed about the miscarriage. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been like completely housebound and bedridden, you know? So, yeah, it is It is very enigmatic. It's very difficult for people to understand. You don't have a specific diagnosis or label for what you're going through, um, like cancer or MS or something. So it's very difficult to communicate with people. And what I've actually found and what I encourage people now to do is to not use of course, any addiction language, because one of the biggest battles that we have in going through this is addiction terminology and the mindset that because you're on a controlled substance, that you're an addict. Um, So I really encourage people to use terminology that is, that more accurately describes our condition, um, such as a neurological damage, brain injury, um, central nervous system injury, things like that, because Really, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, Your entire central nervous system has been injured. Your GABA receptors have been injured. And you're very much, we are like people who are dealing with a closed head injury, or even worse, really, in many ways. Um, So I encourage people to sort of actually leave benzodiazepines out of the discussion when they're initially trying to communicate with others and just say, look, I. I um, took a medication, I was prescribed something, and I had a bad reaction to it, it damaged my central nervous system. But I encourage people just to reach out and say, I'm sorry, I'm dealing with a brain injury, can you help me, I don't understand, Um, can you please explain this to me, or 
um, I have a central nervous system injury. Can, can you please help me? Or, you know, I can't do that. I'm sorry. I'm not capable because I have a neurological issue. That's really important to understand, isn't it? Because there are still people out there who hear the word addiction and equate that to some kind of pleasure-seeking behaviour. And there's absolutely no pleasure-seeking whatsoever in taking many types of psychiatric drug and having to face up to the hell of withdrawal. No, I mean, there was nothing that I wanted more than to just get off of that poison and be done with it. But the problem is, then, the, the irony of this is, is the only thing sort of between you and more suffering is that benzodiazepine. So you have to taper slowly enough to give your body time to heal as you're getting off to avoid even uh, even more suffering, even more injury. And Jocelyn, I wanted to ask, where are you now in the process? How long have you been off the Valium and how is your health? Well, I'm almost exactly two years off of any medications um, since I finished my benzodiazepine taper. And things are definitely better. I mean, there's a, a definite line that you cross when you're no longer in hell. And I'm not in hell. <laughs> but it is still very much like dealing with a brain injury. It's still very much like dealing with a, a chronic illness. And some days are better than others. Um, there are ups and downs. But I find that I've, I've found twice now, actually, that changing my diet has drastically improved my condition for many reasons. Uh, one of which I know is that benzodiazepines directly impact insulin. So a lot of people have blood sugar issues after taking these medications. And if you can stabilize your blood sugar out through either a high protein or, or a high fat kind of diet, a lot of your symptoms um, are managed in doing that. And so I've actually started a new group just recently. It's called Keto for Benzo Recovery. And we focus on a ketogenic diet. Um, which I've just barely, I've only been doing now for not quite two weeks. And I've had just um, amazing improvements. And everybody who's in there, we just, there's just such a, a drastic difference between those who manage their diet strictly and those who don't. That's really positive and again reflects conversations that I've had with others who report that changing diet, some exercise, increased socialising, those are the things that seem to make the biggest difference for them. But it seems too obvious, doesn't it? No, they see, it seems almost too simple, I think. And people are looking for that magic pill or that magic cure. And of course there is none. There's time. There's yeah, getting out and forcing yourself to get out about and um, eating eating healthy. Well, Jocelyn, I'm so pleased to hear that you got past the benzodiazepines. And I know that even two years out is no guarantee that things are easy because healing takes time, doesn't it? I just wanted to talk a bit now about your campaigning because what really brings home the strength and courage of the community of people that have been harmed by psychiatric drugs is nearly everyone I've spoken with has a deep desire to reach out and help support others, even though they've been through such difficult times themselves. It's humbling to witness that spirit, and I just wanted to touch on some of the campaigning and awareness raising that you've got involved with. Sure. Um, well, initially, I started my own channel. It's on YouTube. It's called benzo brains and but uh i just started trying to tell my own story and raise awareness and then um that led to a group uh where another person and i started it was benzodiazepine awareness and legal action and we we started the group partially just to see if there was any interest uh from law firms in putting together a class action lawsuit on behalf of um, all the people who've been harmed by these drugs and um, then it, it just sort of became a group for people to raise issues uh, that were going on perhaps in the media or where they lived regarding benzodiazepines. We tried to help people get disability. There's just a lot of little legal things and <laughs> that we found that there was a real need for this. And then it got to the point where I really wanted to be able to have some validity to uh, s some clout behind me when I try to approach legislators, when I try to approach law firms or the media. And I really felt that there was a need to uh, establish a nonprofit so that we could have something legitimate um, and go into these places and, and ask for assistance or ask for changes in the laws um, and things like that. So we started uh, Benzodiazepine Information Coalition it was really good. I, what we put together was the website at www.benzo.info.com. 
Um, I'm, I'm very proud of what we established. It's based here in Utah, where I'm from. Um, but then right after that, my son had a bad reaction to an antibiotic, and I actually had to step down to care for my son because I was still healing and not 100% well. And then all of a sudden now I was taking care of a disabled son. So things became a little overwhelming and I, I stepped down from my responsibilities there. But now I'm, I'm more capable. My son's doing better. I've been working more with um, WBAD, World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day. I'm supportive of um, the efforts now that we have with Geraldine Burns and in passing legislation in Massachusetts. And I would really like to help people in other states um, try to get similar legislation passed. I'm going to be attending the um, International Benzodiazepine Symposium in, in Bend, Oregon this year. So just, um, I think it's just sort of working your way up to sort of get the word out there, get in touch with the right people, the people who can get things done and educate doctors. Really, I think it's, I'm looking to really have that platform where I can speak to medical professionals and help them understand what benzodiazepines actually do and how that they can actually help people to recover from this injury because that's exactly what it is. And we need to help steer doctors away from addiction terminology and thought processes and guide them towards the information that they need to help people who are physically dependent, who are dealing with a central nervous system injury and need the proper resources to help them um, deal with what is really a severe mental and physical disability. Well, Jocelyn, I have so much admiration for yours and others' efforts to raise awareness of these issues. And you're right, influencing prescribers is key, isn't it? Because if our doctors had taken these drugs and had the lived experience that we have and knew how they affected people, I don't think they'd prescribe them so liberally. But they're not prescribing from a position of knowledge and we're still giving out millions of prescriptions for benzodiazepines and the consequences of that need to be brought out into the open, don't they? Yeah, I mean, there are so many doctors out there who they understand that benzodiazepines are a problem. And I've actually interacted with many doctors who will say, oh, I, I won't prescribe a benzodiazepine. And they kind, of, they kind of pride themselves on that. But I see two big mistakes in that mentality and also in the mentality of doctors who, who do still regularly prescribe benzodiazepines. And that is that, number one, not prescribing benzodiazepines to someone who has never taken one, that's a good thing. To never uh, have this problem in the first place, that's wonderful. But when you have people who are already dependent on these drugs, who are already dealing with that kind of an injury, we need doctors who are willing to prescribe. Um, many people that I, I work with, one of their biggest problems is they can't find a doctor who is willing to prescribe their benzodiazepine in, so that they can get off of it. Um, so here you have people who want to get off of these drugs, and there's no doctor willing to help them. A lot of that, of course, is because here in the States, the DEA is cracking down on the prescribing of controlled substances. So you have a lot of doctors who are afraid. Um, they're worried about losing their own licenses. And so they may have patients who they prescribe to for 10, 15, 20 years. And all of a sudden, they just tell their patient, okay, that's it. I'm not prescribing you anymore after this month. And so the patients, unfortunately are the ones who are, are being punished for the doctor's indiscretions. The other thing is that many doctors believe that benzodiazepines are bad, but antidepressants are good, or uh, some other class of medication is preferable. And so when somebody is dealing with this, a doctor, many doctors believe, oh, well, we'll just prescribe them gabapentin or Lyrica or even Prozac and just help them get off the medication that way. And of course, that doesn't work. You're dealing with somebody whose GABA A1 receptors are damaged, and Prozac is not going to alleviate the symptoms of that kind of an injury where you don't have enough GABA in your system. No, further chemical assault is maybe not the best way to deal with a chemical injury, is it? You no, know, exactly. And so then, of course, what I see a lot of um, is then people are now dealing with the effects of down-regulated GABA B receptors because the gabapentin has injured them now. And so now it's, it's just added insult to injury. So those are two big areas in which I see the medical community making um, big mistakes, is in believing that other medications are going to help this in some way or magically cure this. 
and in just simply having a blanket policy of not prescribing benzodiazepines at all. Um, that doesn't help the people who are dependent right now and need help. No, absolutely. It's clearly a complicated picture. And again, I've had conversations with people who say, let's just ban all psychiatric drugs. But it's really not as simple as that, as there are long-term dependent users who need carefully managed input and support almost on a day-to-day basis. And there really is no quick and easy solution to these issues, is there? No, and a lot of the backlash that we get socially um, in campaigning online and having these kinds of discussions is from people who are currently taking benzodiazepines and believe that they're helping them and have no desire to get off. And it's it's not even just that they don't want to get off, it's that they're terrified of ever getting off of these drugs. And of course, I can understand because when I was on them, I knew what it was like trying to get off and I knew what it felt like to not want to have to face that. And so I, what I try to explain to people is that, look, I have no desire to make you get off these medications. I have no desire to pass legislation that is going to force people to stop taking a drug that they have been dependent on for years. Um, If people want to stay on these drugs, then I really don't believe that doctors have a right to force them off if they're not doing anything illegal or abusing them in any way. Because nobody should really be forced to plunge themselves into hell against their will. If you're going to go down that road, you have to be 100% willing to do it and willing to see it all the way through. And not everybody is going to do that. And that's okay. But if we could sort of phase these drugs out in a, in a way that is protective of patients' rights, that allows the patient um, to have the ultimate say-so in how and when they get off the benzodiazepines, then I think that that will be beneficial for everybody. Um, involved in this situation, whether they choose to get off these or not. Thank you. That's a very important clarification because it's about the right support at the right time, isn't it? Rather than making blanket judgments about what will fix the problem. Right. Um, Because, I mean, we're talking about human lives here. And when somebody embarks on benzodiazepine withdrawal and is as severely injured as we are, their whole life is upended. I mean, you lose family, you lose friends, people lose their homes. Their, your whole life can change because of simply trying to get off of medication that you took as prescribed. So, it, yeah, like you said, it's, it's very complex and it needs to be handled very delicately. And right now what people are doing is they're handling this as a drug addiction problem, as though, you know, the opiate problem is that we're all one and the same thing. And it's just simply not. We're not talking about addiction here. We are talking about a disability caused by a prescribed medication. It's very important to make that clear. Thank you. And Jocelyn, as today is World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day, is there a message that you would like to give firstly to those who prescribe benzodiazepines? I would just say to doctors that many doctors are aware that benzodiazepines are problematic and they don't like to prescribe them. And that's a good thing. And I I applaud them for that. But the mistake that they often make, telling them to go into an addiction withdrawal center is an inappropriate response because these people are addicts. They want to get off the drug. They know it's not helping them. They know it's injuring them. What they need is the proper information to help them successfully get off these drugs. And that's what we have to offer. When you go on to, let's say, benzo.org.uk or you go on to benzoinfo.com, there is information there for the doctors um, specifically to help them learn how to get these patients safely off of these drugs. There's a protocol for tapering. Um, There are different protocols for different methods, such as micro tapering to make it even easier. Um, But we need the medical community support. We need things like medications that can be more easily tapered. Right now, it's very difficult for people on certain forms of benzodiazepines to be able to actually taper at a slower rate because there aren't medications available that can be easily tapered. So we need support from the medical community to get access to better medications and obviously from the pharmaceutical industry to provide us with medications or compounds or things that can can be tapered. And if doctors would be more willing to work with people from the perspective of this person is dealing with an iatrogenic illness, they're dealing with neurological damage as opposed to looking at these people as addicts or crazy who just have terrible anxiety and don't want to face it. If they can see this for what it is, then this relationship between the patient and doctors will be far more productive and we can 
be far more successful in actually getting people off of these drugs permanently. Thank you, Jocelyn. And I also wondered if you had any advice to give to someone who may be listening to this and may be thinking of stopping their benzodiazepine. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is don't be scared by all the horror stories that you hear. (laughs) Not everybody's experience is the same. And if you educate yourself beforehand, if you go on to these websites, if you join one of these support groups on, on Facebook or the online forum Benzo Buddies, and you have that knowledge under your belt, you can do this successfully. You can do this with far less struggle than those of us who have already made all of the mistakes. It's not going to be a picnic. It's not going to be easy. You are going to be dealing with some limitations as you do this. And the best thing that you can do is to prepare for that. Just get it in your head that you're going to be limited for a certain period of time and make preparations to accommodate whatever your level of disability may be. Acceptance is is huge during this, but also understand that you will heal, that things will get better, that you will get back to living a normal life and being the person that you were before you ever got on these drugs. I'm not 100% healed, but I am able to live a normal life. Life is good. I'm happy. And I don't know that things ever can be the same when you go through an experience like this, but I've changed in good ways. Our family has changed and we've become more compassionate, more understanding. Um, Our relationships with people around us have changed. Since I've begun campaigning, I've had so many people come up to me and tell me that either they or a loved one has been affected by tranquilizers. Um, My husband, who deals with real estate and construction, he runs into people almost every week. He runs into someone and he tells them about my story and they tell him, oh, that's like my daughter or that's like my wife or this is going on with someone I know. So this, this problem is huge and one story can make a huge difference. Just getting that information out there. I, in my own experience, it really has saved lives and it continues to. Every time I put up a new video online, I have someone from my life who I personally know who reaches out to me, who's finally ready to face this problem head on and, and do something about it. Well, Jocelyn, thank you for all that you and the other campaigners have done to advise and support others. It's people like you that give us hope for the future that we can change attitudes and give people the help and support they need. Thank you. Jocelyn, was there anything else that you wanted to share with the listeners? Well, let's see. There's there's the film. I'm in the documentary film as prescribed. That's going to be coming out next year. I'm hoping that that's really going to be helpful in explaining this situation to the public at large and helping to shine a light on this problem. Um, And I'm hoping that it will, again, sort of put a framework around this that is not based on addiction, on addiction language and can help society to have more empathy and compassion for people going through this and to see it for what it is which is a severe severe illness and jocelyn do you know what the plans for the film are will it be a national release in the u.s or will it be international too well um the director holly hardman is working um to get it launched in in various theaters throughout the united states as far as i know um initially that's where it's starting but I a lot you know filmmaking is an expensive business and and a lot of it is dependent on funds and if she can get the financial support and things like that to really give this film the proper launch that she would like to give it so all I can say is that um, she's working very hard to get the funding for this film Um, she's working very hard to make sure that it gets the publicity it deserves I'm very hopeful that it will be a a wonderful film and that it will help people to communicate with those around them about their struggle and and get the help they need, um, that it will communicate to medical professionals what this is and, and help them to be more open to helping their patients. I very much hope that too. And it's such a shame that people trying to promote the less well recognized side of the story are forced to scratch around for resources while the pharmaceuticals have seemingly unlimited resource to pour into advertising and promotion. It's so unfair that those trying to rebalance the story around psychiatric drugs really struggle with funding. It is. And then, and then you have, uh, with the BMA came out with that report, um, was it in 2014, 2015? And basically it was saying that most of the funding goes to addiction services. 
And that's a problem because really the majority of people who take these drugs are not addicts. The majority of people on benzodiazepines are dependent. And so it would make more sense for legislators to take a large portion of that funding and put it towards um, dependence recovery and pe- and help for people uh, who are dependent on these drugs. Because what often happens is when somebody is dependent on these drugs and they don't realize it, they're not educated about it, or they can't get the medical help that they need to heal from that, um, it will snowball. And either they take more and more medications that are prescribed, or they go the other route and start self-medicating, whether through alcohol or, Ill, you know, buying prescription medications on the street or illegal drugs in general. So if if we can start this and if we can start to curb this upstream where it's beginning, which is with the prescriptions themselves and the vast majority of people who are dependent, if we can um, sort of divert funds to that um, population of people, I think we can avoid a lot of the expense and a lot of the problems that we deal with downstream with all the people who are dealing with addiction to these medications. Prevention before cure is so obvious, isn't it? But the medical profession still seems quite happy to let people get into difficulties and not even consider the cost of trying to treat all the downstream problems caused by people being dependent on the drugs and taking them, in some cases, for decades. Well, and and a lot of that, I think, is doctors don't know what to do. I mean, when somebody comes into their office and they're dealing with something like insomnia or they're dealing with something like anxiety, they only have so many resources at their disposal. And they're not educated and the public is not educated on the better alternatives that are available for dealing with these kinds of things. And there really are far better alternatives, but they take a little more work. They take a little more work on the part of medical providers and it takes more work on the part of the patient. So a lot of the mentality shift that we need is away from this magic pill mentality and more to... uh, lifestyle change but nobody wants to hear about lifestyle change that sounds like a whole lot of work and nobody wants to have to think about that but really if we're going to do anything to change the face of of benzodiazepines to change the face of the opiate epidemic to change the face of the over prescribing of psychiatric medications in general we have to stop looking for that magic pill that magic cure and we have to start taking responsibility and making those changes in our lives that we need to to actually heal from whatever problems are going on and not just take a pill and brush it under the carpet and hide it behind a closed door in a doctor's office. I agree. If we could show people even just a day's worth of what they might have to go through withdrawing from a psychiatric drug, it would be so much easier to convince them that looking at other areas of their life to change would be so much easier and better for them. Oh, yes. And the thing is, though, I have these conversations all the time. And you have people who are absolutely convinced that they need their medications and that their medications are helping them. And they tend to lash out at those of us who are trying to present an alternative viewpoint and educate people about the dangers because they're afraid. Really, it all comes down to fear. And as I talk with people about this, it always ends up being the same conversation. It's really funny. First, it starts out as you're an addict. Well, you're an addict and I'm not. Therefore, this isn't going to affect me in the same way. And so at first I have to sort of break down that wall (laughs) and then I have to educate them about all the symptoms that you experience while you're still taking these drugs and believe that they are still helping you. And I start going over just simple things like chronic back pain or chronic pelvic pain, chronic infections, just little strange personality shifts and things that you don't realize when you're on these drugs. And as I start sort of As I start to bring out, bring shed light on things that I know that these people are already dealing with, they tend to quiet down. They start to think a little bit and they realize, oh, maybe this is me. Maybe I'm not as safe from this as I think I am. And usually then we can come to a common agreement that, look, we can both support the people who want to get off these meds and want to stay on them. There's a place for both of us in this in this conversation because what both of us need is um, for our rights to be protected and for doctors to be willing to help us um, rather than hurt us. And usually uh, we can come to an agreement. And I feel that, and I really do feel that that's the case. I feel 
that if we can address patients' rights, if we can shine a light on what sort of injury this really causes and educate doctors about how to help those people who do want to deal with getting off the medications and healing from that injury, I think everybody can benefit from that kind of approach. I agree you're right. This is a very touchy subject for some, but that doesn't mean we should avoid the discussion. No, I agree. I mean, because really what you're doing is you're asking people to accept the fact that everything they know could be wrong, (laughs) that everything that they have learned is wrong, and that they may have made a really bad decision 10 years ago that is that they're feeling the consequences of now. And that's a tough conversation to have. And the thing is, James, is that really the, the message that the medical community has for people is a very disempowering message. What they're telling people is, you need these drugs for the rest of your life. There is something wrong with you, and you have to take this medication to correct that, and you will never be able to function without this medication. But the message that we have is that you have the ability to heal. You do not need a medication to function normally, um, to be a whole person. The human body is incredible. It is capable of amazing things. I have seen people getting off these who I really honestly had no idea if these people were going to survive or not. It's like, it's literally sometimes like watching a concentration camp victim and wondering, are they going to get through this? And, and people do, and they heal, and they go on to live good lives. And so the message that I have for people is, you are capable of more than you know. You are probably functioning well in your life in spite of the medication, in spite of what it's doing to you, and you just haven't realized that yet. And you have the capability of actually getting off of this and doing even better than you did before because of the new strength and the new information and the new um, techniques and strategies that you will learn through this process in dealing with the stresses of day-to-day life. That's such an empowering message and so different to the message that you're chronically ill and you have to rely on something external to you for the rest of your life. That's not a good place to put people. No, it, it, it's, it puts doctors in the, in the place of power and control and it puts sort of the rest of us in this herd of, of sheep who just have to follow what they say. But I think we, we just underestimate humanity in general. I, I think... We're, like I said, we're just, we're just capable of far more than that, and we don't need to buy into that, that kind of ideology. Jocelyn, thank you so much for your time today, and I'm so grateful to you for sharing your story with me for the podcast. I'm so grateful to Jocelyn for giving us her views as someone with lived experience and someone who now campaigns tirelessly to raise awareness of the complicated issues around the prescribing of benzodiazepines. For our final interview today, we talk to Barry Haslam from the UK. Barry is a veteran campaigner who has been off benzodiazepines for more than 30 years. He was instrumental in securing funding to help set up the only NHS facility that helps and supports those withdrawing from benzodiazepines, antidepressants and Z drugs. He is former chair of the organisation Oldham Tranks, which campaigns, amongst many things, for a full public inquiry to be held into the prescribing of benzodiazepine medications. Barry tells us how benzodiazepine dependence cost him a decade of his life. Thank you so much for talking with me today, Barry. Can I start by asking you to tell me a bit about your background and how you came to be involved with benzodiazepines in the first place? Yeah, thank you, James. Yeah, um, my story really started in 1976 when I had a complete breakdown. So several facts which withdraw this. I was holding two jobs down. I just moved jobs actually down to Manchester University plus the fact that for about three years I was doing about eight hours a week with studying and work for the accountancy exams, which, you know, I passed then. You know, the, the, you know, the pressure just told and I just had a complete uh, mental breakdown. Um, you know, while I was doing this, I felt fine. But, you know, once I'd taken that final exam and the accumulation of things, and I, I just crashed. Then I went to the doctors and they kindly put me, like I said, the 10 years I were on them, 1976 to 1986, from age 32 to 42, I've got no memory whatsoever of what's happened. So I'm going, what I'm relating is what I've looked at the medical records since, which have been confirmed, obviously, by my wife soon. When I had the breakdown, I, I always put on uh, Librium, I think, that was the first drug, and then several antidepressants. You know, they messed, messed me about with diazepam as well for about five years. And then... 
the, the office very kindly put me on a very powerful drug called Ativan, and they started me on 10 milligrams per, you know, per day, and then increased it to 20, and then it finally increased it to a massive dose of 30, 30 milligrams daily. Why this happened was I was withdrawing from the drugs, even though, you know, physically I hadn't taken a drug, but I, I was still withdrawing from them. And of course, the doctors never picked up on this, and they thought the original symptoms were returning, so they just kept increasing the dose and the dose, which 30 milligrams a day is, of Ativan is absolutely massive. That's more than the standard dose, isn't it? The recommended dosage is 10 milligrams or less now, isn't it? Well, it, it, even then, James, it was, yeah, it was 10 milligrams and, and below. I mean, even now it's moved down to 4 milligrams. So you can tell, even by the then standards, I was on 300% more prescribed daily drug than I should have been. And then, during that period, I was I was also uh, getting, I getting tremendous daily headaches, probably absolutely unbelievable. The, the, the doctors then prescribed me 12 opiate painkillers a day. So not only did I have the problem with the Ativan, I had, I had the problem with the opiate painkillers. And then, I think the turning point, the real turning point, came in about December '85. On Christmas, I nearly hit my wife, so I was turning extremely violent by this time with all the drugs I was on. You know, I just had a bit of moment of lucidity and thought, come on, buddy, this, this isn't you, lad. It's got to be the drugs and you've got to start getting off them. And can you tell us a little about your experiences while you were withdrawing from the drugs? And I had a little bit of help at first with a, a psychologist, mainly, you know, you know just as, as a means to talk, but it wasn't, it wasn't really... You know, it wasn't in any in, any depth that, that I call it, certainly not since. So I started to withdraw myself from, from these drugs at all. And I dropped, I dropped from 30 milligrams of Ativan down to 2, mm. two milligrams in nine months. And during those nine months, I also came off all the opiate painkillers as well. So you can imagine, you know, the older I went through. And then I switched over to 20 milligrams of diazepam, the last two milligrams. And it took me five months to come off those. I mean... That amount is absolutely it's staggering, mm. but not only the amount, but the time scale. But I had no, I had no real guidance. Um, it was ignorance was bliss at the time. You know, I had no laptop, I had nobody to approach. Mm. The doctors had just abandoned me, literally abandoned me. So you know, I just had to get on with it, and, and that's what I did. Every fortnight, I kept coming down religiously until I was off the stuff. But you know. I paid a price for it. I mean, during the withdrawals, you know, I was doing violent sick every day, hallucination, you know, things crawling under my skin, you know, all the usual things that that, that bought over this period. But I also, I also, my, my body weight dropped down to seven stone. And I'm only like a good guy and I built up to over 14 stone. Mm. Um, going off the drugs, I, I, you know, I was down to seven stone and my ribs could clearly be seen. You know, I was in one heck of a mess, to be honest. But, I survived. And Barry, you described such a horrible experience. What was it that got you through those 15 months of that withdrawal period? Um, well, I think primarily it was the, the love of my wife, Sue, mm. and the intense support she gave me. And still do, to be honest, James, even after, I've been off the drugs 31 years, but she gives me this tremendous support. And also, um, I've always said that God found me. And I think he has. He, he, he's found me to do to do this work. And I mean, I call him the big fella. You know, I've got problems. I just often look to him. But he's always been there. I, I mean, I'm not an overly religious person. Don't get me wrong. Um, I, you know, it's just that he's entered my life uh, for a purpose. And, and I believe that campaigning and helping people and getting getting awareness not only of the situation, not only in this country but worldwide. He's, you know, it's, well, I, I come to believe it. Every without this tremendous faith I've got in, not just in, in God, the big fellow they call it, but in, in goodness, James, mm. in, in, in sheer goodness and, and humanity that is out there and, and, and needs tapping into because, you know, this thing that, that's happened to millions and millions all over the world, it's just totally wrong mm. that governments, departments of health officials, licensing authorities, they've ignored it, completely ignored it, swept it under the carpet and yet, you know, humanity and goodness keeps bouncing back and bouncing back and, mm. That's, that's what's drawn me, Jim. That support is so important, isn't it? And it's so tough for people to see their wives, husbands, sons, daughters go through these experiences. It's really hard for family, firstly, to understand that a drug that was meant to be helping you can cause such damage. And secondly, to watch the person they love fall apart physically and mentally and not be able to do that much to help. 
Yeah, that, that's that's totally right. And I think it's also the sheer frustration for them, Jerry, because you know, in, in most other illnesses, you've got you've got places to go for help. But with this, there's virtually nothing in this country, nothing in the world, and in this country, um, and that's going to be that's going to be so wrong. The services of for the legal services, for urban addicts, for alcoholics. I mean, Glasgow are just thinking of providing over two million for a particular service or a building that addicts can go and shoot up in. I mean, I'm not knocking the illegal side. That's a separate issue. But we, as hydrogenic addicts, benzodependent patients, you know, we, we trusted the clinical judgment of the doctors. We didn't take this, you know, off our own bar. We didn't, we didn't take it to get high. And yet, the Department of Health and the National Treatment Agency in the past, and they're still doing it, they're trying to push this issue as a calling of misusers and abusers. And we're not. We're totally not. Mm. And this is the this is the cop out. That's why they, they you know, they, they get get the lid on this thing because. They, they just want to avoid total responsibility and accountability for um, what Professor Ashton has described as a medical disaster. And it is. It is, I agree, Barry. If we were dependent on alcohol or nicotine, we would get more support from the health services and more recognition of the problem and probably more sympathy even than being dependent on a substance that was prescribed to us. Yeah, that's perfectly true. And also, James, I think, again, one of the, probably the main reason why we're not getting any help from government and the Department of Health is because they are they're absolutely terrified. They are petrified of taking the lid off this Pandora's box, should I call it, because of because of being sued. It's going to be the main reason. It, it, there's no other. I mean, I, I know the, the 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 power of the farmer comes into play with the lobbying, etc. But for government to keep stum on this for decades, absolute decades, and cover it up, it's got to be because they're absolutely terrified of the scale of the problem. And we know it's increasing. It's not decreasing, it's increasing, increasing. And certainly within, I mean, I think the SSRI, sorry, the benzos and the, uh, the Z drugs levels are more or less stable to about 16 million. Mm. But certainly the SSRI prescribing rates are absolutely going through the roof. I think it was over 64 million in England for 2016. And it's just unbelievable that this is happening without any, without not only recognition of the problem, but we're not putting in any services into help for it. And it's got to be totally, totally wrong and, and it's totally immoral. Barry, you've been incredibly courageous to feel so unwell, but still to get so involved in campaigning to help and support others. Can you tell us a bit about your campaigning work? Well, when I did come through it, I, I got to thinking, well, you know, what's out there? You know, for me to find out exactly what's happened to me, you know, because I kept searching and searching. And eventually I found... Well, I found my way into this thing, and I, I just couldn't believe, I just couldn't believe the horrors that, that, that I was discovering, you know, with clinical papers, uh, which I was sending off for, you know, by post, etc. And I just built up like this, and then I joined a group called Oldham Tranks, mm. uh, which was founded by a, a remarkable guy called Mike, Mike Levins, who's, who's since died, and and later on, I, I took over as chair, and it, it's it's and it's still going. It's a, a peer support group run by you know ex benzodiazepine uh, drug dependent patients. You know, for the for, for the people, well, not just for the people of Oldham, because we've had people coming from the surrounding districts, and um, you know, have come help from they come from Liverpool, um, they come from Huddersfield, they come from Stoke. You know, so it just shows the, the demand for such a service. And then because of the campaigning. Um, I was doing a lot of local campaigning with with a, a tremendous local paper called the Autumn Chronicle, mm. and they buy me so for many many years now, and, and they, you know they, they've done brilliantly by me, and by me by coming out if, if you like and campaigning and putting it out there to to public attention, it attracted the attention of the director of public health for Oldham, a cracking guy called Alan Higgins. So Alan called me in one day to, to said, can, can you come and see us, Barry? Me and one or two officers. We want to do something about the situation here in Oldham with prescribed benzodiazepine dependent patients. So we, we worked together and we worked out that with over 5,000 long-term arthrogenic addicts of benzos in Oldham. So we set about uh, how to go about it. The the council at the time, they put out a tender for services and it was won by um, a charity called Addiction Dependency Solutions, which now also works under the heading of, of, of One Recovery. 
and we've got it's the only two two services probably in, in, in certainly in the northwest of England. I know there's one in, there's one in Leeds, but certainly in my immediate area, there's one in Oldham, and there's one in Bury, which has just been formed about a couple of years ago. Mm. So this service was introduced in 2004 in Oldham, and it's still current. And the good thing is, although it was intended, and then it was primarily for benzodiazepine uh, drug-dependent patients, it's now been extended to patients who are on SSRI drugs, the antidepressants, Z drugs, uh, which we know are very similar to the benzos, mm. and opiate painkillers. Mm. So now we've got full range of services uh, for dependent patients. And I, I, I honestly believe that, I'm fairly certain that this is the only NHS-funded facility in, in the country. And that is because of the publicity, the campaign that I was doing. And a few years ago, I met with one of the public health ministers. It was a conservative one, and she went out in the room, this meeting we had in Oldham, and pointed to Alan and said, Alan, how, how did you get involved in this? And the smile on his face, he pointed down in the room at me and said, it was because of Barry. It was a pain in the backside. But you know, you know James, so by being a pain in the backside, just kept campaigning and campaigning. We've got this with this unique service here in order, which I'm, I'm done out. I don't think that there's, there's another one in the country like it. Thank you, Barry. The determination that you've shown to get help and support for others is nothing short of amazing. And Barry, if we could make more resource available and we could influence legislators and policymakers to ensure they know about these issues, what should we be doing in the UK, the USA and elsewhere to make the biggest difference to people dependent on benzodiazepines? Right, well, the first thing I would certainly do in the UK is to to get official government notification from the Department of Health or Minister down to all the clinical, commission, clinical commissioning groups in this country to put in services to help people dependent on prescribed drugs. That's gotta be that's gotta be the first. The Department of Health copying out again as they they always have done by calling it a local issue, local needs know the you know, know the area, etc. etc. And that's Totally and utterly wrong. It's got to be a national directive because this is a, na- a national problem. So that's that's the first thing. Then if we can introduce peer support groups like Oldham, like Oldham Trying, which are in addition to the clinical commissioning groups, because then we can use the expertise of the people who've come through it, come through this dependency, and are still coming through it, and we can pass this expertise on to others. We can learn. We, we, we can actually learn therapists. We can learn therapists. We can teach therapists because one of the greatest things that I think the medic, medical profession can have and do is to accept humility, some humility on this because it's, it's totally cocked it up. They've totally made a mess of this. So that's some humility, like just like Professor Ashton did when she ran a withdrawal clinic in Newcastle for 12 years and she learned from the patients and that is what we've got to get around. We've got to come back to that. We've got to push whatever has done in Newcastle for 12 years uh, and we've got to push it we've got to push it nationally so we have clinical commissioning groups setting up dedicated services like we have here in Oldham so there's, there's nothing to stop them mm. if Oldham can do it if Bury can do it then the rest of the country can do it but we certainly need the political will by government and the Department of Health certainly to push this as a national issue because it's is, you know it's a national scandal but tackling it piecemeal saying it, it's a local issue that is well out of order. It's common sense, isn't it, that a national approach to this would be far less costly than a piecemeal local approach and having to reinvent the wheel every time. And the lessons learned from groups like yours in Oldham could easily be used as a template for many other centres. It would, it would, it would, you know, I mean, the, the savings would be absolutely enormous. Not only to, to get, you know, to get people better, it would, it would, it would save marriages, it would save families, it would save individual lives. And I reckon, just on a conservative estimate, it would save 400 lives every year. We've had something like over 20,000 deaths since 1960 with benzodiazepine drugs in this country, caused by suicide, poisoning, and road traffic accidents. Now, if you respond that 20,000 in a football stadium where they all died. You know, the world would be up in horror and saying, what, you know, <laughs> it would be absolutely up in horror. But because it, it's been done on a yearly basis since 1960 and it's been swept under the, on, in, under the carpet and kitchen along grass by government, you know, it's just forgotten. And it's very much a hidden problem, this. And it's got to be put, it's got to be put out there in mainstream 
mainstream public attention. It has to be. It does, you're right. And Barry, on behalf of the whole community of people affected by these issues, I wanted to thank you personally for the efforts that you've made, particularly given that your own health is not great. And despite that, you've spoken out and you've made a nuisance of yourself, which is how to get things done on this sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, James. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've not done this for any, any personal worth or personal gain. I just know that what what has happened? It's you know it, it's just it's just sheer evil, and we need we need to redress the balance. I mean, one of the loveliest parts that I've found, James, in in, in all this, or several actually, but is that the ten years when I was on the drugs, and my two daughters were aged six and seven, and then I see them growing up, sixteen and seventeen, and I've no memory whatsoever of them growing up, a family life, of any involvement. But now I've got we've got three lovely grandchildren. I were grown up into young adults, and I've seen them grow up. But much of the point, I've been active in, 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 the, in the development in bringing them through as, as, as human beings, as good human beings, and, and you know, good, good family members, good children. That I, I couldn't, I, you know, I never had the chance with my own, with my own children. So I've been so thankful for that, which you know, I can't thank God, God enough. And also, James, I've, I've met so many wonderful people doing this that I would not have done if, if, if I'd have been in, in another walk of life, if I'd have, if I'd have I'm tired this breakdown and I stopped in Manchester University, you know, I'll probably retired when I was out 50 or whatever. I would not, not have seen this side of life that, that's been so, so valuable to me. You know, I, I can't put it into words. I would not have missed one single minute and one single day of what's happened to me. Mm. Not one single minute because it's brought me into such contact with such good, good people, kind people, and very, very brave people. You know, because me and Sue still take calls, locally, you know, and nationally. Mm. But so many good people out there that, that we, we've helped. And, and, that, and that's helped me as well, because I know from badness has come goodness, but it's also the, it's given me the drive to help people to put things back in, into my life that was taken out with, with those 10 years, you know, and it certainly, it certainly, it certainly helped me too, because, you know, by, by fighting what we have fought and will I be in my 50 years next year, it's brought us so much closer together as a couple and as a family that it's been worth it. Like I said, I would not have missed one single minute of everything that's happened to me. Thank you, Barry. And I know that's not an easy thing to say, given everything that you had to endure over those years. And Barry, I think you said you've been off the drugs for 31 years now. And how is your health? Because, again, people don't necessarily understand that benzos are not just a problem while you take them, or even while you withdraw, but they can continue to be a problem for many years, can't they? Yeah, they do. I mean, in my case, it's it's, it's a little bit unique in in, in the amount of quantity of drugs I was taking, but saying that... I know many, many people who, who, who are still hurting and suffering protracted withdrawal symptoms or even permanent damage many, many years off the drugs. I mean, I've had two MRI brain scans which showed I've got brain atrophy. The last one also showed up five years ago that I've also got narrowing of ventricles in my brain uh, and fluid on the brain. And there could be no other, other reason but only for the, the amount of drugs that I've taken. I've also got thyroid deficiency, a B12 deficiency. Uh, I've also got neuropathic pain, James, from my right hip right down to my toes. And I've had that ever since I came off the drugs 31 years ago. So there is there is hard evidence of permanent damage. It's just that it's never been collated. It's never been clinically trialled. Or, and this is something that I think it definitely needs to be done in the future by government departments, by research departments, we need this hard evidence of the damage that long-term prescribing of these drugs do to the patient. Got to happen that um, because all the clinical trials of the, of the drug companies, obviously, certainly with the benzodiazepines, uh, they've only very have a short term. You know, only matter over a few weeks, and yet people have been kept on these drugs for 10, 20, 30, even 40 odd years. So we don't know. The full, you know, the the full implications of being on these drugs prescribed long term, which again the doctors have ignored the guidelines. But we we also know that benzodiazepines increase the risk of lung cancer, they increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, and they also increase the risk of brain damage. And those are established facts. So for people to be on these drugs for many many years are not offered adequate withdrawal services. Even for the ones brave enough, I would say. 
to want to come off these drugs because not everybody will want to for obvious reasons. Um, and it would be rather it would be cruel for some people to be brought off them. Certainly with no, no family support and if they're on their own, that's going to be very really much an individual decision. But for the ones who are brave enough to want to come off these drugs, services should be there. They should be, you know, they should be made appropriate and funded by government. It's a national problem. And it's got to be tackled by a national, a national government. Certainly in the USA, I'm, I'm, I know that there are quite a few sort of campaign movements now which, which, which are coming very, very strong. You know, which is excellent. It's out, uh, over there, of course. The the, the medical situation is, is is different because people have to pay for the drugs, etc. And obviously, you know, the cost is very high. Uh, but people are fighting back, and, and we need them fighting back. Not just in the USA, in Canada, all over the world, wherever they can fight back, fight back, please. Because you know, one single voice can make a difference, as I proved here in Oldham. Well, Barry, the results that you've achieved are testament to that. And it's frustrating too, I imagine, because you've proven that it's perfectly possible to practically help people to get the advice and support they need. And while we can't withdraw for people, they can be supported psychologically, we can make them feel part of a community and that they have somewhere to turn. It doesn't necessarily need to be medical intervention, does it? No, it, 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 it doesn't. I mean, I, certainly I, I didn't really get any medical in, intervention. In fact, I just had to go on and, and, and do my own thing. You just get on with it by the doctor. They, they just deserted me. But you're right, certainly the peer support group we have here in order, that can be done in every town and city by therapists, by ex-dependent patients. And so the patients start putting their expertise back in, start putting it back into society, then not only can we help uh, these people, we, 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 we can help society. Thank you, Barry. And was there anything else that you'd like to let the listeners know? Well, yeah, one thing I would like to mention, please, is the tremendous dedicated work done over the course of a life by Professor Crystal Ether Ashton, who ran this particular service in the University of Newcastle. And Ether is very seriously ill now, and she's quite aged. But the amount of work and passion that she's put into this issue, and not only that, but the, the withdrawal protocols that she's, that are actually worldwide now, they've been, you know, they've been translated into so many languages, you know, the dedication and, 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 and the love for this, for this lady is, you know, it's it, it just immense. And my sadness is that the British government has never recognised her services to the people of this country. And they should have, they should have done many, many years ago. Certainly we in, in the Benzo community, you know, we just love this lady because of what she's done, what she, the time and effort that she devoted to people. And I met her a few times, and she, you know, she's a tremendous sense of humour and, and a lovely, lovely lady. These protocols, withdrawal protocols, can save so many, many lives. Every doctor's surgery in this country should have a copy of Professor Ashton's withdrawal protocol on benzodiazepines. And also, I think I'd like to, to pay tribute as well, James, to all the people worldwide who have committed suicide because of benzodiazepine. They, they create suicidal ideation, but also the, the horrors, as I know what I went through, the horrors that you, you go through coming off these drugs, taping. There, there is absolutely nothing in this world to compare them with. There is nothing in this world to stack it up against. And I think once you come through the episode... I've come through benzos. It makes you so much stronger that nothing, nothing ever will ever face you again because you face the worst terror, your worst enemy that anybody can do as a human being in this, in this life. Thank you, Barry. And yes, it is important to recognise both Heather Ashton and Malcolm Lader for their work and for being some of the very few medical professionals who will step outside the wall of silence to say that this is a problem and this is what can be done about it. Barry, thank you so much for talking with me for the podcast and for your heroic efforts to draw attention to these issues and for the time you've spent personally advising and supporting others. You're very welcome, James, and, and likewise, everybody out there, that's for sure. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm, st I'm still, still continuing fighting. I'm, I'm, obviously, I'm still continuing helping people and doing what I can. The, the, the need is, is so great out there. It, it gives me a purpose in life, not just that. I do it because I, I know... You know, I, I know what they're going through and what they've gone through. I think I've said in the past, I've forgiven the, the doctors who've done this to me, but I can never forget because of my own individual circumstances, how it's left me, but also the people I, I help. That redresses the balance for me. 
Well, I hope you found it enlightening to hear from Professor Leder, from Jocelyn and from Barry. I'm very grateful to all of them for being so generous with their time and for helping me to understand the issues that still exist around benzodiazepine prescribing. We heard Professor Leder describe the fact that we have known for many years of the difficulties with drugs of this type, but that the medical authorities have taken decades to even recognise the issue, let alone take action. We heard Jocelyn talk about some of the many complicated issues that surround the prescribing and use of benzodiazepines, including the complexities around regulation of their use and the distinction between dependence and addiction. Finally, we heard Barry explain why we need action to be taken. Firstly, to provide support to those who reached out for help only to be harmed in the process. And secondly, to ensure that accountability for these issues sits squarely on the shoulders of those responsible. As a reminder, more information on World Benzodiazepine Awareness Day can be found by visiting the website wbad.org. That's w-bad.org. Thank you so much for listening today. If you do want to get in touch, you can email podcasts at maddenamerica.com. And if you enjoy this podcast, please leave us a review on iTunes. Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates. 